Boy, no camera yet. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. Welcome, everybody. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here. And today, we're going to be talking about demographics for Candid. I'm so excited. We have a lot of Candid members here. And um, Lashika Phillips has kind of introduced us to Candid. So I'm excited for that. Uh, you know, you're not on our web regular webinar. So if you want to come on camera, say hi. We would love to see your face. Um, if not, you know, stay behind the camera, type in the chat, let us know where you're zooming in from, um, anything you want to say, your questions, put them in the chat. They have lots of team members to, with Candid. If you need the closed caption, you know, you can just type on the CC button at the bottom of your screen, probably where it says more. I'm going to move out of the way and introduce you to Lashika Phillips, and she's going to um, introduce you to the Candace team. Lashika, thank you for being here today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for getting us started. And uh Hello, hello, welcome everybody. Really so happy to be here. Really, really loving this energy. Um, again, my name is Lashika Phillips. I am the Director of Equity, Inclusion, Diversity, and Culture here at TechSoup. And thank you. Just really happy that you all have decided to join us for this very important webinar uh, on enhancing transparency and equity and informed decision making specifically in the nonprofit sector. And as nonprofit leaders, we all know how important it is to collect and share demographic data to not just demonstrate impact, but to also meet funded requirements and to contribute to sector-wide insight. And um, as Aretha mentioned, we are thrilled to have a candidate. We have Caesar, we have Tracy, and I think they have other colleagues in chat um, who will introduce us to candidates' demographic um, initiative. So really excited to hear about that. This initiative, it empowers nonprofits to streamline the process of sharing demographic information, but also uh, enhancing both the grant, the granting process for your nonprofit's disability. So without further ado, I'm happy to turn this over to Tracy and Caesar with Candid. Thank you all so much for being here. Take it away. The floor is yours. Great. Hey, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Tracy, and I'll be kind of starting off our discussion a little bit, and then I'm going to turn it over af after a little while to my colleague, Caesar, who's going to focus in very heavily on the demographic aspect of Candid Profiles. But give me just one moment as I share my screen. All right. Um, so this session today, it's really going to focus on these candid profiles on GuideStar. Why do these profiles exist? What purpose do they serve? Um, why would it be worth your time to focus on what's in your organization's candid profile on GuideStar? Because you probably have one, even if you've never seen it before, even if you've never touched it before. Talk about how do you update them? Who looks at these? And in a little bit, Caesar is going to take a much deeper dive into where does the demographic aspect fit in to these profiles as a whole? Um, sound good? And if you have questions along the way, I'm always happy to hear questions. So before we really get into it, it might be helpful to just talk a little bit about what is Candid, in case anybody is not too familiar. Uh, so Candid is a nonprofit organization uh, made up of two pre-existing nonprofits, which are Foundation Center and GuideStar. So Foundation Center, one piece of what Candid is, has been around for a long time, since 1956. And since that time, Foundation Center has been the number one source of data and information on foundations and their grants worldwide. GuideStar has always been sort of the flip side of Foundation Center. GuideStar has been around since the early 90s and is the number one source of data and information on the nonprofit sector within the U.S., and about five and a half years ago, Foundation Center and GuideStar joined together 
became one organization. We changed our name and now we're known as Candid. And so now all of that information about funders, about nonprofits, about really everything pertaining to the nonprofit sector and the, or the social sector as a whole, it's now all in the same place. And our mission is centered around the fact that every year, millions of nonprofits spend trillions of dollars around the world. Our job is to find out where does that money come from? Where does that money go? And why does it matter? We connect the people who want to change the world to the resources they need to do it. And so today we're really honing in on one of those resources in particular which is everything you can find on the website, guidestar.org. I'm going to use Guidestar and Candid almost interchangeably, but just keep in mind the website you would go to to examine any of this further would be guidestar.org, but it's part of Candid. Your nonprofit's presence on Guidestar would be known as your Candid profile. Uh, so anyway, so what are these things really? So part of the arrangement when you are a nonprofit organization within the United States, at least, is transparency. All nonprofit organizations are really kind of committed to this notion of transparency, which really has its origins in your tax returns. So every nonprofit, is filing every single year a Form 990 with the IRS. And everyone's 990s, everyone's tax returns in the nonprofit sector are public documents. And anyone who wants to look up the inner workings of a US-based nonprofit organization can do so for free on the internet any day of the week because that's just how it goes. And one of the places where people will go to look up a nonprofit organization and examine their inner workings is GuideStar. So if you are a nonprofit organization, there is a pretty good chance that regardless of whether you've looked at it or not before, you have a candid profile on GuideStar. And so anyone who wants to research what's going on at your organization is able to do that there. At the very least, through your most recently available tax returns. But you also have the option, if you so choose, to go into your nonprofit's candid profile, claim it, gain editing privileges to it and be able to add additional information so that you're sort of able to take charge of your own narrative and use this profile as a sort of storytelling tool to make sure that you're putting your best face forward in the world while also kind of maintaining a commitment to transparency. And so why is it important to know about this information and the way it is presented out there in the world through our website. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever taken a look at the Edelman Trust Barometer. This is something that comes out each year. And the Edelman Trust Barometer measures the public's perception of various institutions and public trust in various institutions. So it changes a little bit each year. This is the, the current 2024 one. And one thing you might notice immediately is that pub, like the general public's trust in, for instance, government and media is not good. Um, but that is kind of not our issue to fix right now today. Our issue that we are focusing on is up in the upper right here, NGOs. So that's the nonprofit sector. So none of these positions here are talking about the actual trustworthiness 
of any of these institutions. It is how the general public perceives these institutions. So the good news is that us in the nonprofit sector, we're not in the position of media or government right now in public opinion, but there is still a lot of work to be done here. You see nonprofits and business showing up as measuring as a somewhat on the ethical side, somewhat on the competent side. But at the very least, you would think that nonprofits would be doing more than marginally better than the business world in, for instance, ethics in pu public perception. And we should definitely be perceived better in terms of competence. If you think about what we all do every day, what the nonprofit sector does for the world, considering we are handling housing, health care, education, tons of other really important services that really like the communities that we live in cannot survive without. And so we kind of have work to do in terms of presenting ourselves with the competence that we truly have. So what can we do to kind of improve our standing as nonprofits within the public eye as the ethical and competent institutions that we are? It can really help to kind of take the time to use this commitment to transparency to show here's what's really going on behind the scenes at our organization. Here is the good work that we do. Here's the impact of the good work that we do. Here's how it all operates. And here's all of the, the nitty gritty details underpinning all of that great high impact work in terms of our staffing, our finances, our operations, all sorts of things. So this all leads into what happens when you take the time to claim your nonprofit's profile on GuideStar and add information to it. The more information you add, the greater the seal of transparency you are awarded. Now, these are not seals of approval. That is not Candid's job to say, this is a good nonprofit, this is a bad nonprofit. That's not what we exist to do. We exist for the sake of the sharing of information, for promoting transparency. So that's what these are. It's showing how transparent of an organization are you. And these seals of transparency that are awarded, they go from bronze all the way up to platinum, depending on how much information you provide. A bronze seal of transparency, honestly, you could have one in five minutes. It's that quick. Uh, whereas some of these others, they get progressively a little bit more involved until the highest level platinum, where you're putting in a fair amount of information about the, the work you do and how you operate. And I'll give a little more detail on what goes into these different seals of transparency in a minute, but I think it's just good to see them a little bit first. So what are the benefits from your perspective as a nonprofit organization for taking the time to do this? For one thing, I kind of struggle in doing these presentations without feeling as though I'm selling you something and, and, and like we're, we're, that is not what's, what's going on here. This is a free service. We are, after all, a nonprofit organization. Uh, this is a free opportunity for you to build your visibility and your credibility online on a site that is looked at by the general public, of course, but also by funders and by donors as well. So as kind of a supplement to any other web presence you have, your website, your social media, et cetera, this is a good self-contained place where information about your organization can live as a well-told story. This information is used by a wide array of partner organizations and by people. Well over 200 different partner institutions, for instance, make use of the data that comes out of Candid and that comes out of GuideStar. 
And so it's good to at least make sure that the information you have in your profile is accurate at least. But this is also in a very real way beneficial for your fundraising. So there was a study done in 2018. Uh, it was done, I think, through Villanova University, and the results of the study were published in an accounting journal. There was a study done of two cohorts of nonprofit organizations over a couple of years. In year one, none of these nonprofits had a seal of transparency uh, through GuideStar. In year two, one of the two cohorts only received a seal of transparency on GuideStar. And what the study found was nonprofit organizations that take the time to complete their GuideStar profile and get a seal of transparency, they received on average 53% more charitable contributions than those who did not do this. So I think this piece of information alone is kind of, I think, a strong argument for why it's good to take the time to do this, especially considering that it does not take the longest amount of time and it does not cost a dime. Now, who exactly is looking at this information? Uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, we have over 200 different partner organizations that make use of our data. As a small sampling, you can see some of them here. So, for example, a lot of the large tech companies make use of this data. For instance, if you have ever participated in a Facebook fundraiser, like if you've ever run a Facebook fundraiser for your organization or another nonprofit that you're excited about, or if you've ever donated to a friend's Facebook fundraiser, uh, a ton of money moves through these fundraisers. And all of the information that they have on the page that will say, oh, about this nonprofit, when people are clicking to learn more about the Facebook fundraiser, all of that information about the nonprofit gets pulled automatically from Candid and from a GuideStar profile. Um, donor advised funds. I don't know how many of you are, are, are lucky enough that you have been receiving money from people with donor advised funds in the past. But almost all of the major donor advised fund vehicles, like you can see here, uh, Fidelity Charitable, Vanguard, Schwab, etc., they pull information from Candid's data. Uh, so if someone, for instance, has a donor advised fund through Fidelity, they're able to log in on Fidelity's website to their donor advised fund account. And if they decide, you know what, I would like to donate to an arts organization in Florida. Let's say the person lives in Florida. Uh, I want to look at who are all of my options of organizations out there doing interesting work. So what they can do is through their account in Fidelity, they can look up who are the arts organizations in Florida and do some research and read up on these organizations before they make a decision who they want to give to. So the question is, what are they gonna find out about you as they're doing this research? Um, another interesting thing is down at the bottom here, grants management. When you apply for a grant with a foundation, and they receive your application and it's time for them to kind of do their due diligence and make sure that everything that you've written in your grant application, it checks out with all of the other like details in, for instance, your tax returns. Uh, these major foundations, they have their big fancy grants management software. They'll log into Blackboard or whatever they happen to have, and they're able to pull up your information that you have in your GuideStar profile through Candid, that all of this data, it feeds into the grants management software so that they can look you up and it's like looking under the hood of a car and they can make sure, hey, 
everything that we see in the grant application and everything that we see in their profile through Candid, are they telling a consistent story here? Does everything match up? Does everything make sense? Is this a trustworthy organization? They're able to do that. So all of the information that you choose to share there, it gets around to a wide array of people and a wide array of organizations. So it kind of makes sense to take some time and make sure that what you have in your profile is the story that you're hoping to tell. So with that in mind, what goes into actually claiming your profile? So if you've never done this before, what you, you start by doing is you go to just guidestar.org and you make just a free username and password for yourself, create account. And once you have made your free login, you're going to search for your nonprofit. You can do it either by organization name or by your EIN, do a search, and you just fill out a few quick fields to validate your connection to show, hey, I am a legitimate representative of this nonprofit organization. And at that point, uh, we, we have staff on the back end who take the time to make sure that you really are um, a legitimate representative of your organization. So with that in mind, if you want this process to be fast and to hopefully have access to your account like within the same day, it helps if you're using your work email address to make this happen, like a .org email address, because then it's a faster kind of path for our staff to, to travel along to make sure that you are a legitimate staff member at your organization. Whereas if you're doing like a Gmail account, they're gonna probably need to do a little bit of extra work to make sure that you can have access to this information. But when you get approved, uh, then you're going to be able to log in to your profile using that username and password that you set up earlier. And they're gonna tell you what is your nonprofit organization that you have on GuideStar? And since Candid is a nonprofit, if any of us staffers at Candid log into GuideStar, hey, here's our organization, here's Candid. And you can click update nonprofit profile to get started. You can edit your profile. And at this point, you can really go to work. So here are those seals that we have again. Let's take a look quickly at what goes into each one of these. And then in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Caesar to talk a little bit about kind of the demographic aspect of what we ask for in these profiles. Okay, so like I mentioned, you could get a bronze seal of transparency very, very, very quick. All you really need here is Put in your mission statement, make sure that your contact information is up to date. If you do those couple of things, you are all set to go in terms of a bronze seal of transparency. And that will already put you at a bit of an advantage in that it'll make you stand out uh, next to other organizations that haven't necessarily done that yet. And this makes sure that if someone does find you on the site and wants to give a donation, that you have up-to-date contact information for them to send donations to in that case. If you want to go a little further, there's the silver seal of transparency next. So this involves like program information and branding. So here you can think through what are some different programs that you offer? Maybe if you're a small organization, you only have one program so far, or maybe you have multiple. Just think through what are things that you want to highlight? Any program that you run that you want to highlight, write a short description of it, and you can include, hey, what geographic area does this serve? What population does this serve? Is there a particular budget attached to this program? You have that option here. And you'll see images on the, on the right here that show, hey, what does this look like in real life when you load up your profile? Also, you have the option to put in any branding information, which can kind of be nice as like a 
supplement to your website as a storytelling tool here. You can put in your logo and your tagline here. So we have our tagline here, see the world, make it better. You can put in any of your social media handles if you want to. And if you're interested, you can put in photos. You can put in a short video of your work in action. So when people look you up, it's kind of like, ooh, it looks nice. It's exciting. And it really give, gives them a little something to play with here. So, so far, pretty simple. And then we approach some slightly more involved levels of uh, these seals here. We got the gold seal of transparency next, which involves financial and leadership information. So when it comes to finances, either way, if your tax returns are already on your profile, which pretty good chance that, that they are, that will all automatically pull some financial information. But if you want a gold seal of transparency, you have a couple of options. If you have audited financial statements, recent ones, you can just upload that and it'll fill everything for you. And that makes things pretty quick and simple. If you do not have audited financial statements, because a lot of us don't, then they'll just have some fields for you to complete manually asking you some financial questions. And then we move into kind of the demographic piece of what you'll find when you're getting to the gold seal of transparency. So Caesar, shall I stop sharing if you want to control your own slides for a moment? Uh, sure, please. Thanks, Tracy. Great. So I'll just jump over here. Hopefully you all can see the same slide. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on where you're calling from. My name's Cesar Delavalle. I use he, him pronouns. I'm director of partnerships here at Candid. Wanted to take a little bit of a detour into demographic data land. Uh, for those of you that are a little bit more interested in um, what is demographic data, why is it being collected by many different stakeholders throughout the sector? How can your organization use it? Um, and how is it all woven into what Tracy's been sharing thus far today? We thought it was important to kind of set a little bit uh, of a foundation to better understand who is Candid as an organization, uh, what is the GuideStar profile, and then what are the different seals of transparency. Um, so to begin with, uh, just wanted to make sure we're starting from a, a same, a similar place, uh, which is an understanding of what demographics are generally. Uh, so as you'll see, the slide says demographics are statistics that describe populations and their characteristics. Um, I feel like it's a, a big word that sometimes can feel startling, but most of us are quite familiar with it from just census data uh, and the way that already governments, uh, municipalities, uh, universities, et cetera, are using it for a number of different purposes. And then, of course, we have demographic analysis, which is simply the study of population-based factors. So again, demographic identities include age, race, sex, uh, and many others. Um, so for today, we wanted to speak a little bit about an initiative that Candid has been running for the last uh, couple of years now um, that's called Demographics via Candid. Um, I wanted to begin by sharing just a, a really brief origin story, however. Um, so as uh, philanthropy was hearing uh, the many calls in response to social justice movements, racial justice movements, uh, in, in the, the tail end of the pandemic, kind of 2020, 2021, a lot of foundations were trying to rise up um, and they were making racial equity pledges. They were making commitments to have a more diverse set of grantee, uh, a more representative set of grantees. As these funders were looking to increase their funding to specific communities, um, as the data partner, many were coming to Candid and were asking us if we had demographic data on their grantee portfolios or their community at large. Of course, demographic data is not something you contribute in your 990. It's not something that you can just web scrape. It needs to be contributed and it needs to be contributed uh, with consent. Um, so not only were we seeing this growing desire for demographic data from particularly grant making institutions and researchers, um, we were also experiencing what that desire felt like. So for Candid in 2021, for instance, we were asked to fill out over 100 different demographic surveys, which can sound like a bigger or small number, uh, depending upon where you're coming from. But if you take into consideration that every survey with a small tweak to a question, a small tweak to an answer field, meant we needed to go back and resurvey our staff every single time. So it was a very inefficient model for a collection of demographic data. 
Also, once we filled out these surveys, it was just supporting that one individual funder or that one individual entity. So we thought to ourselves that there must be a better way. Um, this is a, a something that we continue to invest into and to understand what the nonprofit experience is. Last year, we actually commissioned a little bit of research by an organization called Viewpoint Consulting, which is led by an individual named Kelly Brown, who's been uh, doing demographic taxonomy work for over three decades. Um, she was serving and engaging a group of nonprofits and um, about 1,500 organizations with nearly uh, about 72% uh, saying that they were reporting demographic data still just recently to at least one funder um, or philanth philanthropy serving organization like Candid, uh, but that half were reporting to it to five or more entities. So we see that many of us are still being requested this information in a multitude of manners. And that's where I, we're trying to step in to see how we can actually centralize and standardize this data. So Demographics via Candid is really meant to build on what already exists, which is the Candid nonprofit profile. That's why Tracy's been telling us so much about what is the profile, how do you access it, how do you claim it, ensuring everyone understands that it's a very free resource for you all to be able to claim. Uh, our vision really for the Demographics via Candid initiative is for an organization to go on to their profile and to share demographic data just one time once a year in a standardized format and ensure that any social so social sector stakeholder can access that data freely uh, and easily accessible. Uh, in order to ensure that organizations feel supported as they are both collecting and uploading this information, we've invested into a number of different capacity building resources uh, and support structures, which I'll, I'll share a little bit about here in a second. Uh, and as this information is increasing, we're able to actually provide some novel reports that start to look at representation in the sector uh, and to ensure that this data is actually made freely available to anyone who would like to uh, utilize it. So when we speak about uh, demographic data, we're specifically speaking about race and ethnicity, gender identity, uh, sexual orientation and disability status. And we collect that for the leader, uh, the co-leader should it exist, uh, the board, the staff and the senior staff. So what you're looking at on the screen right now, this is Candid's demographics. Uh, and this is just a screenshot of what demographic data looks like once it's been uploaded to your Candid profile. Uh, and as Tracy was sharing, that's part of what actually gets us to the gold seal of transparency by sharing this information. Uh, really, we only are asking for demographic data on your leader, uh, which often serves as a proxy of the organization. But you can see here the value of having that throughout all of these different um, aspects. Um, so what we believe uh, and what we intend to accomplish with this initiative is that uh, in support of nonprofits like yourselves, this will help to reduce the paperwork. As I said, the many surveys that are going out, uh, it will actually help to increase your visibility with funders. That's why it was really important how Tracy was sharing that the more contributed data that you have in your profile, that's exactly what uh, DAF holders are looking at, grant makers and funders are looking at when they're doing their due diligence on you the same way that you do your due diligence on a prospective funder. Um, but by contributed demographic data, you're also able to highlight uh, a commitment that you have made into diversity and inclusion. And we also want to ensure that you're being incentivized for your time. So um, in a second here, Tracy's going to speak a little bit about the Go for the Gold initiative, which is a wonderful initiative that allows any nonprofit with under a million dollars to be able to access foundation directory for free uh, once they reach their gold seal as well. So I wanted to really quickly hit on a couple of resources for, for nonprofits that exist. So um, as Aretha had shared in the chat originally, all of these slides will be shared with you all afterwards, um, but I still wanted to just go to a couple of websites here. So the first thing that we've put together is actually a, a demographic data collection survey template uh, and a user guide for how to use that template. Uh, so you can download the template. We have some really helpful videos here on how you engage your organization, how you survey them, uh, and then how that information is back uh, and uploaded uh, to the Candid profile. So this is probably one of the resources that we see is most utilized for organizations that are collecting this information. Um, but we recognize that there are several of us that are still thinking, well, gosh, I don't know if I fully get why I should be collecting demographic data. Um, and how and where would I even get started? So we put together this really simple um, kind of 10 minute self-paced learning course on demographic data, 
Um, why should you collect demographic data on your organization? We have some really short videos here uh, and you just kind of continue along. Um, beyond that resource, um, the one that I would really recommend to everyone is this knowledge uh, article that we have here, which is simply, what is the Demographics Be a Candidate Initiative? Uh, and how could I as a nonprofit potentially participate? So we spell out a lot of what you're hearing today around the potential uh, value and utility of this information um, with a host of different resources that are linked, et cetera, uh, and a very simple how to get started guide here. So those are just a handful of some of the resources that we've put together. Um, and what I wanna also share is what all of this means um, once we put all this together. So I think as we've been seeing organizations uh, contributing more and more demographic data, um, the benefits uh, are not just in support of a foundation, an individual entity, but it's really to help the sector at large have an aggregate view to inform equity across the sector, to help different stakeholders uh, standardize and benchmark uh, according uh, to comparable organizations, to identify gaps and track, track progress to goals. Uh, and also for an opportunity for organizations that may be excited to share more of how they are reflective of the communities they serve. Uh, and again, all of this with the intention to ensure that a nonprofit is sharing your information uh, just one time rather than through all this, all these disparate surveys. Um, for anyone that is interested in this information, um, either from a research perspective, perhaps you do advocacy in your local community, um, all of this information is made for free. So as we've said, it lives on your individual guide start profile. Uh, we've also created a demographics API. API stands for application programming interface, which isn't the most helpful acronym, but that's pretty much the way that one data set speaks to another. Uh, and speaking of different data sets, uh, as Tracy had mentioned, many foundations use grants management systems uh, to actually do grant applications and to review those grant applications. And that's where some of these APIs are at play. Um, so if you filled out any grant application and if you've seen the names of a Flux or a Foundant or a Salesforce, um, all of this candid data is already deeply embedded there. We also have a Tableau dashboard, which you can look up to see, well, what does demographic data look like as far as the nonprofit diversity in my county or in my state? Uh, and then for anyone that wants to do some research, we actually offer all of this data for free uh, in a downloadable spreadsheet. So when I say all that data, um, we are very excited that since we've launched the initiative, we now have, um, frankly, I was looking this morning, almost 73,000 nonprofits which have shared their demographic data a continuous stream of uh, new organizations sharing it. Uh, and to give you a sense of what that means, that's over 1 million individual nonprofit staff members. So once we have this quality and this quantity of contributed data, we're able to actually put some really novel research out into the sector. Uh, earlier this summer, Candid uh, developed this report, which is called the State of Diversity in the US Nonprofit Sector. And it's the first of its kind and frankly, it's a report that wouldn't have been able to be realized even just a few years back. What we're seeing is that we're able to put data uh, and objectify what some of us may have already been feeling, which is that, for instance, some key findings, the U.S. nonprofit sector becomes less diverse at higher levels of leadership uh, and uh, that there is greater CEO diversity in small organizations, um, but that decreases uh, as the organizational budget uh, increases. Uh, and that, for instance, uh, if you are a nonprofit run uh, with, a, with a budget over a $25 million, you have a six times greater likelihood of being right, run by a, a, a self-identifying white man. So we see some clear discrepancies here. Uh, and this is where we want to build some visibility into where there are some discrepancies in representation. Um, one of the key statistics that we saw there was that while 50%, a little bit less than 50% of all nonprofit staff self-identify uh, as white, uh, we see that 70% of CEOs and nearly the same number of nonprofit board members identify as white. So this is a clear, uh, significant opportunity for us to improve as a sector to increase representation ultimately. Um, this uh, data point um, may seem either new, startling, not surprising whatsoever, the way that I think of it is if you're a nonprofit that is investing into gender equity and you don't demonstrate gender diversity, then how can you truly fulfill your mission? 
And these are the sorts of questions that a lot of funders are going to be asking themselves. And that's why we have an invitation for you all to share this information. So um, I left my uh, contact details here in case anyone has any questions around demographic data. Um, there's still a, a little bit more to share around the seals. So I'll stop sharing, uh, Tracy, and I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. But we will be happy to take some Q&A as well. Great. Thank you, Caesar. I already see there's a there's a quick question from Laura in the chat on uh, can some of these links in the chat be sent to us? I do believe everyone who's attending is going to receive a copy of the slides and that we can make sure that any relevant links are included along with that. Perfect. I was just going to say I could send all these links because I just um, sent uh, our AMS. I was like, hey, these are some good links. I can send them out via email, but I will um, if they're hyperlinked to the PowerPoint, that's great. Um, feel free to ask your question. I have a question as I was talking. Let me remove your spotlight, um, Caesar, so we can all be. Um, Let me stop sharing for a moment then. Okay, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go well, ahead. if people want to ask questions, it might be good if we can all see each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does anybody have a question before I before I ask my question? Okay, so I think you answered it because as you were talking, I was like, hmm, the Democrats, they're only asking about demographics of the leaders. And then I thought maybe sometimes the leaders, you know, the the board members and the person who started a nonprofit may not reflect the community they serve. Like if I am on a board for people with disability, just because I have a passion, I'm not, I'm I'm not disabled. I don't have a disabled family member. So it doesn't reflect the the community. But then when Caesar, you showed that last slide, the one about how you're looking at the demographics, you're showing that, you know, white males serve high. I was like, oh, okay, I get it. So the light bulb moment came on of, you know, seeing the bigger picture, but I was concerned about um, some of the demographics and people, the public seeing it, they may say, well, it's just me being devil advocate. I'm not going to give to this organization because X, Y, Z, you know, by looking at the demographics. So Caesar, jump in here. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say there's, there's a couple of pieces. One, um, I think it was really important how Tracy was sh sharing earlier that we are not a ratings agency. We are not one to say what is a good or a bad nonprofit. Uh, frankly, if, if you haven't contributed much data, what we tell to a lot of our stakeholders is that that's simply an invitation to inquire and to ask a bit more because we know how constrained organizations are and perhaps they just haven't gotten to the opportunity to share it as of yet. Um, also from a diversity perspective around demographic data uh, uh, specifically, one, it should only be shared with consent, meaning that it should be done willingly and excitedly because many of us are excited to share our identities. Um, and then you should also consider it through the lens of representation. You know, you were talking Aretha that, well, I'm on the board of an organization that invests into disability um, and I, I don't have one myself, uh, either behavioral, physical, et cetera. But if you actually compare your community and the percentage of those that are suffering from a disability, you know, that's what representation looks like. You have at least one or two people on your board that may have a disability. When we think about it from like a racial perspective, if I'm a nonprofit that's operating um, uh, in a rural community that may not be that diverse, then it is fine if you're not diverse because you are representative of the community that you're serving. And for us to think of our identities in a multitude of ways, just like you were sharing about uh, how you don't personally self-identify as someone with a disability, but you're more than excited to be able to invest into the needs that we see there so clearly. So this is just a, a body of work that helps many individuals have an additional data piece um, as we're thinking particularly around philanthropic capital flows, as donors, institutional and individual are thinking about that, but it should never be seen as a penalization of, of any kind. Okay, I see Ashley, Ashley Kramer has raised her hand. Ashley, you can unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Thank you all very much. Um, I was just wondering if you have any sense of how commonly understood the fact is that these ratings are about transparency and not quality, just because the connotation of gold versus silver versus bronze versus platinum does have kind of a value-based um, or quality-based kind of connotation. And so do you think it's very well understood by people looking at it when they see this is gold, this is silver, this is platinum, 
do they understand that that's about transparency or do you think that there's misunderstanding around how those labels are interpreted? Uh, yeah, well, Caesar, jump in if, if you have perspectives uh, on this. I find it's kind of a work in progress, personally. Like, I think when it comes to, for instance, funders, they, for the most part, seem to be aware that this is about transparency, especially given that we call these seals of transparency. The word is in there. That being said, um, I find that anytime I am discussing with the public the subject of Candid Profiles and GuideStar and Candid's data, inevitably the question seems to come up, what is the difference between you and Charity Navigator? Are mm -hmm. you doing the same thing? That question always comes up and that shows that there is still work to be done on people really understanding that this is transparency, not approval, because that is the difference between us and Charity Navigator. They are doing something different. They are evaluating what is a good, effective organization versus maybe a less effective organization. And that's a, that's a, it's a valid thing to do, but it's a totally separate thing from what we are doing. But I think there is still work to be done in that area for, for the nonprofits themselves, at least. Thank you. Maybe picking back on what Ashley asked, under under that seal that goes sell in parentheses, you put in the demographics is just for the leader, the board member and staff and not the community itself. Mm, just throwing out there. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, you can just put in your leader and your board. You can include your staff as well. But the question of the community around you, that is that is a totally separate question from what are the demographics of the people on your team at the organization? Right. No, I was saying, um, isn't the goal still about the leaders? Because I, I may have heard it wrong. The goal still was, or whichever one, the top one was, just demographics on the leader, the board, and the staff, correct? Yes. Right. So it's not asking about the demographics of the community. No, it is not. Okay. So I was just saying that maybe, um, picking back on what Ashley say, can you guys put in parentheses that the dem these demographics that you see is just on the staff, the board, and the leader? So that... I, I'm a, a funder. I might say, oh, okay, this is just on the staff and not the community they serve. I'm just, this, just, you know, throwing it out there. Thoughts yes, that may be a good idea to explore. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Um, feel free to unmute yourself or use the raise your hand option like Ashley did. And you were going to show us another slide, um, Tracy? Yeah, I have a little, a little bit. Okay, left, uh, not not the most left. If we want to just, oh, um, um, Dr. Arletta. Question. Hi, Dr. Arletta. Hi, I, I don't have a question so much, but I find this an interesting conversation because I think it's important to know the leadership. And if you're serving a community that you're not a part of, that gets into, when as a funder, it's like, are you just collecting cash or are you actually asking to, um, actually funding that community because I see that a lot in nonprofits. So I think it's important for us to know who's in leadership in these organizations. So I find it very complete to have who who's actually staffing these things and who's actually leading it. And if you're serving a community that you don't look like, for me as a consultant and as a leader, I find that to be an issue. I, I would also uh, add, Dr. Orletta, what, what we're also seeing is, is the high utility value for the organization themselves uh, to ensure that there's transparency internally around professional development opportunities and to build Absolutely. bridges for all of their staff to be able to Absolutely. change leadership positions. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that oftentimes we, we, we may over-focus on who is asking for this data, i.e. A, fund, a funder, and we don't want to be donor-centric. We don't want to bend to all funder whims. 
but we do see a tremendous amount of value for organizations to be able to have internal conversations on why is it important to diversify our board? Why is it important to create leadership development opportunities as well? Uh, so just wanted to piggyback off of, of your comments. I completely agree as well. Awesome. Chris, I see your hand raised. And if we go over time, Tracy and Caesar, that's that's totally fine. I think this is a great conversation. Go ahead, Tracy. Uh, I mean, Chris, yeah, want to ask your yeah. question? Uh, me, Aretha? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, so my question is, um, I went to the guidestar.org and looked for my organization. Um, I already noticed a couple of mistakes just for the head title alone. Uh, where did all this information came from? The, the little information that you have online, was this only pulled out from, you know, public uh, information that was just kind of put into this uh, file and we go in and correct everything and we're able to do all of that. Yeah, if you've never touched your profile before, but you mm -hmm. find what's already there, what you're seeing there comes straight from the IRS. Ah, um, I see, I what, see. Okay. Yeah, whatever information the IRS has on you, including what comes from your tax returns, that is what feeds into what you're starting with. So mm -hmm. if you notice something there that isn't right, then yeah. that means that there's going to be a little bit of work to be yes. to be done there. I'm glad I went because obviously the name alone is wrong. Uh, it's supposed to be Philippine nurses, not Filipino. So I'll have to check with our treasurer who files our IRS, what's going on. And I'm really curious to really see when you said leadership, that would be either our president of the nursing organization or the chair of the board of directors. But I'm part of the board of directors. But my um, concern would be they may not be representative of everything that we value. Does that make sense? Um, so how do you go about that? Maybe a brainstorming and meeting of everyone to get the full input before it's just one person who is completing the information for us? Well, I think Caesar may, may have talked about already, like kind of the resources that we have on how to get started in gathering this information. I think usually... Okay. We recommend that you start with your leader and move from there. Um, okay. But you may find it's helpful if kind of the demographics of your president and of your board, if it doesn't tell the full story, that may mean, yeah, you want to include more staff-wide demographics mm -hmm. as well, which is kind of the step that you can get to once you've tackled leadership. Okay. But we have really good resources on the website that kind of help yeah, guide and you thank through you the for process. The okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Thank you so much. Hey, Lynn, um, she inboxed me. She's not able to raise her hand. So um, feel free to unmute yourself, Lynn, if you can. And then we'll go to the Cramden Institute. Hope I said that right. Oh, Joy. Joy. Your name is Joy. <laughs> okay. Got you, Joy. Feel free to unmute yourself. And I can see if I can unmute you if you're not able to do it real quick. Let's see. All right, um, Crampton Institute, you can go ahead and ask, ask your question while we figure out Lynn's um, Lynn slash Joyce. Hi, everyone. My name is Cindy. I'm at the Cramden Institute. We are a uh, technology refurbisher for um, the state of North Carolina. We are a nonprofit. Um, I appreciated this session. I knew a lot of the information coming in. And I just have to say to everyone who is new to this process, it's definitely worth doing. Um, the way we um, got from bronze to platinum um, or gold to platinum was simply first knowing that some of our grant makers, our foundations are asking, what is a composition of your board? So we did a web form, a Google form, asked our board chair if it was okay to ask questions of sexual identity, um, pronouns, uh, disability, and they were all for it. The only question they asked to strike was, um, I think it was um, 
pronouns. Everything else, everyone agreed to. We got that information and we use that when we apply for grants. And then I went back to um, Candid and I updated it and was fully transparent and we're now platinum. So the platinum has given us an opportunity to take pride from our staff as well as our board. Nice. Um, put priority in diversity and inclusion on our board and in our hiring as well as I get listed in places and people come and ask us, ask me to come speak about our organization. So now locally, people are using Candid's information about who are top nonprofits in our local community. So I just want to say a thumbs up to the, the exercise of doing that. It has not cost us anything and it's just brought us a lot of benefits. Thank you for that. That's a great story of how this could be leveraged for some real success and kind of underlines both that credibility and visibility angle and how that can help you out with both of those things. Yep. Awesome. Lynn, are you able to unmute yourself? I have you pinned, so you should be able to unmute yourself. All right. Um, Tracy, while she's figuring that out, you want to put your slide back up? I think there was something you had to share. Yeah, I had just a little bit more because we're going kind of step by step through each of the different seals of transparency. Um, and we have one more remaining. So, do, 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 do. all right. So quickly, based on what Caesar just covered on what it takes to get to the gold seal of transparency, which is near the top. One really nice side benefit of getting a gold seal of transparency or a platinum for that matter, because this applies for platinum seal members as well. If you are a small nonprofit where your annual budget is under a million dollars per year, if you get either a gold or platinum seal of transparency, you will get as part of the deal a free one year subscription to the foundation directory on the essential level, which is a pretty nice benefit. I don't know if anyone here has used the foundation directory before. That's kind of the, the flip of GuideStar. It is the database of all of the different funders out there in existence, over 200,000 different funders, so that when you're doing your prospect research to find where your next foundation grant might come from, foundation directory is where you go to make that happen. So you would be able to get a free subscription if you get a gold seal of transparency or a platinum. Um, I do believe we have a, we have a link for this somewhere. Let me actually uh, find that link. Um, let's see here. Go for gold. There it is. So if anyone is interested in learning more about this, basically after you get your seal, you go to, I think, the benefits section within your, your account on the GuideStar website, and you'll find a coupon code, code there. Um, which you can apply as you set up an account with the foundation directory and it will give you a completely free subscription and it would be rather useful. Okay, and so this also applies to the platinum level. So let's briefly talk about what is involved if you want to go all the way to the, to the top and get a platinum seal of transparency, which seems like it's going to be a lot, but it, it is not as complicated as it seems. So first of all, strategic plan. If you have a recent strategic plan, like from within the last five years, you just upload your strategic plan and you've done it. If you do not have a current strategic plan, they'll just ask you to answer two questions manually instead. And those are, what is your organization aiming to accomplish? And what are your strategies for making this happen? Honestly, if you've applied for grants in any recent years, those are two questions that every funder wants the answer to anyway. So you're probably well acquainted with answering to these two questions on a regular basis already. So if you answer those couple of questions, okay, you're good. 
and you get the chance to kind of demonstrate the impact of the work that you do. So if you go through your various programs, you can find a few metrics that you want to share that are going to tell a story of success, of getting results, of making an impact. And those will display themselves on your profile, similar to this image that you'll see on the right here. It says our results. This is from Candid's own uh, profile. We have a platinum seal of transparency ourselves. And so you can see, oh, the number of organizations you can find on GuideStar. And you can find that number over time. Uh, the number of seals of transparency people have gotten. You can see that number kind of tell a story of growth over time, etc. And you're allowed to include context notes so that if you have a strange year, where your outcomes are a little different from what you might expect normally. You can explain why, which is nice. Because for instance, in years like 2020 or 2021, I don't think those were typical years for really anybody. For a lot of us in the, the early stage pandemic, either we found that our outcomes were really not as good as they usually are, or for some, that they kind of exploded and we reached way more people than we usually do. Uh, so if you have a strange year, you have the option to kind of explain that through context. And if you want, you can include a target population and connect any of these metrics to a specific program that you run so that you're really kind of explaining, yes, our programs, they work, they get results, here's the evidence. If you're struggling to choose impact metrics, we also have this wonderful resource um, that I, I, I love and I wish more people knew about it. The Common Results Catalog. This is a resource you can find on our site uh, that gives you ideas of different types of metrics that you could use if you don't already have something handy. It's a free resource. I just want to show it to you because I love it so much. I have a big ugly link to share for it in case anyone wants to look at it. I think there's a cleaner link for this somewhere, but this I think will work. It's a giant PDF that goes into different subject areas. And as you start scrolling through, like let's say you are an advocacy organization. And you want to know what are some different metrics I could use to show that we get results. Um, you'll be able to see things like, oh, number of new advocates recruited or something, um, dollars donated to support advocacy efforts. And you can just keep going from here. And so this applies to all sorts of different subject areas here. So this is great for fleshing out your profile, but I also share it because it's just a nice resource to have in other aspects of your nonprofit work. If anyone has spent time planning or designing a new program, creating a logic model, things like that, having some ideas like this, it could be useful for you. And so that's a really nice thing that can help you get to platinum, but it can help you in other ways in your life as well, I think. So after you've done all of this, you, if you have completed all of that information, you could have a platinum seal of transparency, but whatever seal level you choose to get to at this point in time, basically you get into your profile, you put in the information and you hit publish. Boom, you have done it. At that point, there's another step on the site, benefits. And so this is gonna give you some resources to kind of share some of this information with the world. Like if you have a platinum seal of transparency and you're proud of it and you want to put it on your website, for example, they'll give you options for here's how you put that on your website. And you will get a unique a link to your profile that you can share anywhere you want. You send out fundraising emails to your audiences. 
Um, you're posting on social media, you have your e-newsletter, you can share your link around. And so anyone who wants can take a look at the full profile with all of the information that you took the time to put in. And so that way you can really spread the word. And I think it's become obvious that we do have a ton of resources that can help you out along the way with all of this. Uh, including we have a Seals of Transparency guide that we offer every single year and we update it every single year to kind of walk you through, here's all the information you need to gather in order to get this done. And we have a really robust help section on our site too, that area that says help.guidestar.org. That'll walk you through any issues you run through. Um, like I can't find my organization on the site. They'll tell you, why you might not be able to find it and what to do about it so that you can access it going forward. Or, oh, I can't get this aspect to work. What do I do now? Uh, so we have good FAQs on the site and you can also connect with our support team and they are lovely people who, many of them, they live and breathe this work and they know exactly what to do to get you on track. So that can help you tremendously. So, if you're convinced and you wanna keep moving from here, what's next? Take the time to claim your profile, put in information and earn a seal of transparency, use some resources along the way, and we hope it's helpful for you. So that's what I've got. What do we have in terms of uh, any other questions to finish, uh, finish us off? That was good. Um, I think Cesar was answering Lynn's question, but Lynn, if you can fill out that program and get access to um, the Foundation Center, that would be amazing. Any other questions before we leave? We did go over a few minutes, but I think it was important to do that. Questions, comments? What was your one takeaway then? Put it in the chat. What was your one takeaway from this webinar? One thing you learned from this webinar, we would love to know. And if it, even if it was just, it was a great webinar, not webinar, Zoom meeting. Yeah, Zoom meeting. If it was good information, we would love to hear it in the chat. Ah, uh, yes. Definitely need to respond to the reminders from Candida. <laughs> yes. Totally get it. Totally get it. Well, thank you all for being here. I want to thank um, Lashika Phillips for inviting Candid to be here. Um, Dr. Orletta, thank you so much. Um, you're glad to, you took the time to update your guys' our information. Dr. Joe says it's fantastic. Tracy, thank you for being here. Caesar, um, Jason, I missed somebody else on your team. Give me the name. Starts with an A. I don't want to mess it up. Arif. Arif. Almost like Aretha. Can't mess that up. Thank you so much, Chris. You aim to publish your nonprofit through GuideStar. This is great. Thank you all for being here. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.